Hi, Erin again, and you are looking at me, not from Dartmoor, England, still at my kitchen table. Um, one of the fun things that I do while confined to my home is choose Zoom screens of places that I've been or places I hope to go when all of this is over. And um, this place I actually, I actually visited. Um, oh gosh, it's been probably about six years. And um, yeah, we'll have fun however we can during the pandemic. So let's get started on what we're actually doing. The purpose of this video is to review a few concepts that I talked about last week, as well as concepts that I'm gonna introduce this week. Because I want to lay out a foundation for why we're doing the things that we're doing in this class and how they might apply to your future, the future that actually matters for you, the future that you're going to inhabit um, when you leave San Diego State University. So this is Identity Genre Mentor Texts and your next blog, what we do in this class. And um, in this video, which I hope is very short, we're gonna talk about the concept of genre. We're gonna talk about mentor texts and we're gonna talk about your next blog. But first I wanna go back to G and the concept of identity. Sorry, I just made my head bigger and I just, wanted to, as I jump all over the page, I really just wanted to, you to see the heading there. Um, G and identity. If you recall, G claims that anytime we're using language, we're communicating who we are. And it isn't just the language that we use, it's the way we use it. It's saying, writing, doing, being, valuing, believing combinations combined with a whole lot of other things like the way we dress, our gestures, um, our grammar, our body positions, our clothes. And it's an identity kit, a complete costume that makes people think they know who we are, even if they might not. And it can be frustrating if you're thinking about identity um, because you might actually belong to an identity, but you haven't mastered all of those trappings. Or you might not belong to the identity, but you're really good at faking it. Or you're in the process of learning how to be in that identity. And so awareness of this concept is important. What we're focusing most on in this class is language and adapting language so that we show that we have the identity that we're trying to occupy. Now, what does this have to do, moving my head again, what does this have to do with RWS 305? Well, RWS 305 is it about exposing you to new types of writing that you haven't done before. It's in the title, writing in various situations. Why? Because in your life outside the university, you're going to need to develop new styles of writing. I cannot possibly teach all those styles of writing. Even if this were a class focused on, oh, I don't know, um, engineering, there are so many types of engineering that one class wouldn't do it. And even if we could, um, the style of writing would vary depending on the industry you were in and the culture of that industry. And so it's just not possible for me to know all the types of writing you will do in your future or all the types of industries or even all the cultures. So I can't possibly teach all those styles of writing. But by exposing you to new styles of writing, blogging, magazine writing, using personal essays, resumes, cover letters, um, all of these things, I can help you develop strategies for learning new styles of writing. Now, every style of writing, and we'll call it a genre, has unique conventions, um, characteristics, styles, 
And when you, you adopt them successfully, you show, you share the identity of those who use that genre. And so in this way, we're back to read. It's all about writing rhetorically, adapting to your audience and their expectations and adapting to your purpose. What do you want to accomplish with that writing? Now, let me give you a few genres associated with identities, because the way you write says something about who you are and your identity. So if you go into law enforcement, you're going to write incident reports, you're going to write tickets, um, you're going to prepare for depositions, um, you're going to testify in court, and you're going to take notes on those. And the way you write says a lot who you are. Um, friends and students who've been in law enforcement tell me they have lots and lots of details. They want to remember as much as possible. And so it's very story driven. Whereas if you're in the military, you're writing reports and orders and forms, and you're going to leave out words that, yeah, it's going to be a lot more concise, probably not have all the details that law enforcement have. Similarly with health professionals, um, a long time ago, once upon a time, I was a medical transcriptionist and I used um, abbreviations, HX standard for, stood for history, it still does, SOP, I don't remember what that is, um, subjective, objective, and Clearly, I have forgotten. Um, but all of those things, it's a very different style of writing. And if you give all the details, you show that you are not part of that discourse or that identity. Business people, you're corresponding to clients and you're corresponding to colleagues. If you're an educator, you have to learn to write syllabi, quizzes, prompts, IEPs, professional development reports, all of those things. Um, Accountants, you write accounting ledgers and something else. I don't really know what. Um, even in your personal life, you're writing letters, texts, emails, tweets, uh, TikTok videos. Um, these are all genres and they all have unique characteristics. And when you embrace those characteristics, when you use those characteristics, as part of that identity, you show you're part of that identity. When you seem knowledgeable, like you share that identity's values, and you will seem more credible. So why follow genre patterns? Um, because you seem more credible. And you do this all the time. Um, thank you notes. They always do the same things. Thank you for blank. Here's how I'm gonna use it. Here's why it's valuable. Something else so it doesn't seem like you're just saying thank you. If you are writing a haiku, a sonnet, these have unique characteristics and there's a beauty in occupying those. They're challenging, there are constraints and limitations, but you can create beauty out of the structure. Why, oh, I wrote resume twice. Because it's so important. Why do you follow the patterns with resumes? Because the people who are hiring you are looking for specific information in specific places. And if you are just go all creative, they won't find it quickly. And you probably won't get the call back. Um, you've probably, um, there are genre patterns with work cited or resources page or bibliographies if you're using another format that's why do that? It shows you're part of that discourse community, that academic community. Similarly with the academic papers, lab notes. Shoot, I have to have structure and genre patterns with a syllabus. Why? Because it's a legal document and I need to cover a lot of things. And as I occupy those, as I do them according to conventions, I show that I'm part of that identity. 
So the question becomes, how do you approach a genre you've never used before? And how do you look like you know what you're doing? Because we have to learn the genres at some point. Now, it's possible that you could just ignore genre conventions because after all, you're creative and um, you could, but then you won't show that you're part of that identity. And that could hurt you in some identities and erode your credibility. Um, you can mush fake and mush faking means that you're pulling from um, all the available resources that you have in order to fake it. And a lot of you in your discussion boards described how you've done this in the past. I have definitely done that when I'm traveling. How do I fit in with a culture that I'm not really sure about? Well, I can read about it on the internet in advance, but ultimately I'm there and I'm me and I'm American. And, but I want to honor that country that I'm visiting. And so I need to figure out how to do it. And so I'm watching and I'm following the patterns and I'm making mistakes and I'm correcting. That's mush faking. Here's another idea, especially with writing, with genre writing. You can find a mentor text. A mentor text is an example of the genre that you use as a model. And it becomes my guide and then I mush fake. How do I do that? Well, I take a look at the example of that genre and I look at it closely, I examine it. I'm analyzing structure, I'm analyzing patterns. It's not on the slide, but I'm analyzing vocabulary. What goes in this genre? What kind of vocabulary am I looking at? And then I adapt all those patterns to fit my topic and my purpose. So yes, there's a degree of credibility, but I'm adopting the structure to fit my purpose. Some years ago, I worked for a small nonprofit and my boss, um, we were growing as a nonprofit and my boss asked me to write an HR policy manual. We'd gone from about six employees very rapidly to 12, and we knew we would be up to 20 in a matter of months. And so it wasn't really possible to just share our culture organically. We needed to create policies that we could follow and to help us if there were any legal difficulties. Now, I had never seen an HR policy manual, um, let alone written one. And now I was tasked with writing one. And so I went onto the internet and I looked at mentor text after mentor text. I found them on the internet and I began taking notes, examining each one carefully to see what went in, how did, were they worded, they had a lot of similarities. And then I began to craft our own using those as a model. I was able to adapt it for our purposes. Now, that's what a mentor text is. Your next blog is a poem. Yay, a poem, you all are so excited. Um, I am not a poet. I took a creative writing class. Oh gosh, maybe, yeah, it was 1981. And um, that is the only class I've ever had to write poetry in. And so, yeah, that's, yeah, that's 40 years. Um, I imagine that it's been fewer than 40 years since the last you last wrote a poem, but I don't imagine most of you write a lot of poems. And so let's talk about how to use a mentor text to write a poem. Your mentor text is George Ella Lyons' poem, where I'm from. And there's a copy of it um, on your blog prompt. And 
you are going to use her as a mentor text and you're going to examine her patterns and her structures. What does she cover? What kind of vocabulary? How does she use rhetorical strategies? How does she use details? And then you're going to write your own where I'm from poem. Here's how she starts. I'm from clothespins, from Clorox and carbon tetrachloride. I'm from the dirt under the black porch. Black, glistening, it tasted like beets. I'm from the forsythia bush, the Dutch elm, whose long gone limbs I remember as if they were my own. I'm from fudge and eyeglasses, from Imogene and Alifair. I'm from the know-it-alls and the Pasadons, from perk up and pipe down. I'm from he restoreth my soul like a cotton ball lamb and 10 verses I can say myself. She continues, but you can read it on your own. So what I wanted to do is I took this and I wrote my own poem because I wanted to see what it felt like. And I wanted to use this as a mentor text because I thought it would be good since I was asking students to do it. Incidentally, I asked them to do it for about four semesters before I finally got the courage to do it on my own. And this is my poem. By the way, this is the house I lived in when I lived in Hawaii. Um, it's changed significantly. Um, this fence over on the left, um, that did not exist. And I still have the scars when I jumped from the, I was all of six years old, and I jumped from the highest point and landed on my knees. And I had scabs for, gosh, forever scars today. Um, somebody decided that wasn't safe and they put up a fence and that was probably smart. So you can see the similarities and yet you can see what I'm doing and how I adapted the structure to tell my own story. I am from Sunshine, from the train tracks in Phoenix and Pearl Harbor Elementary School in Honolulu. I'm from the suburbs of Denver, a red brick bungalow surrounded by red brick bungalows. Swing sets and vegetable gardens and an overgrown blackberry bush with thorns. I'm from the plumeria tree, my sister and me, sitting in the branches with needle and thread, making lays, playing journey to the center of the earth under our house with stilts. From learning to live in snow and hang on to two mittens for an entire winter. The sun is shining, but it's so very cold. I go on, but you'll have to go to my blog in order to do that. It was hard at first as I started examining the mentor text and I could see her themes, George L. Lyons themes of church and how she used smells and places that meant a lot to her, that it shaped her. And I came to, from this. My dad was in the Air Force. We traveled until we moved to Denver. But I always lived in places with sunshine. And it's probably why I live in San Diego now. I love sunshine. But San Diego didn't shape me. Um, Phoenix, Honolulu, and Denver, they shaped me. So. I'm gonna let that go. You write your own mentor tag, your own where I'm from poem. You post it in your blog, pay attention to the details. Um, there are details, length, hyperlinks, sometimes references. Always write about what you know about or interested in, passionate about, show, don't tell, adopt an audience and purpose, and I'm out. Have fun this week and be sure and contact me if you have questions or concerns. I'll be available on Tuesday um, for office hours and that's all I got. Thanks. Bye.